My name is Jay Sugarman, and I want to welcome you to Innovation Showcase. The main purpose of this ongoing series is to inform viewers about exciting innovations and creative individuals across the fields of business, science, technology, education, and the arts. Today via Zoom, we're fortunate to have as our guest, Kirsten Levy. Kirsten is a Newton-based writer, and she's here today to inform us about her engaging book entitled Alzheimer's Fantasy and the Key of G, an imaginative and emotional memoir about Kirsten's mother, Fran, and her decline from Alzheimer's to dementia. During the program, we're finding out why and how the book came about. And we'll hear about the unique approach Kirsten took to writing this absorbing and informative account. In the end, we'll come to better understand and appreciate the devastating nature of Alzheimer's and the trying roles of caregivers. Let's start by meeting Kirsten and then finding out all about Alzheimer's fantasy and the key of G. Welcome. I'm delighted you're able to be here today, Kirsten. Well, I'm very pleased to be here. Truly, this is um, somewhat of a milestone at <laughs> my advanced age. <laughs> well, I really appreciated the creative approach you took to telling your mother's story and about her condition. But before we hear about your use of storytelling, would you please share a little bit about your background, your career, interests? Well, I would have to say that um, the principal um, thing that comes to mind are my more than 30 years with Boston University um, in uh, the School of Medicine. Um, I was employed uh, first, I came to see the research enterprise, so to speak, from both, uh, both ends of the coin. First, from the researcher's point of view, where I was employed by the director of the Cardiovascular Institute, and um, that was uh, a good 10 or so years. And then later, from the university's point of view, the university, the central administration, they're the ones that say yay or nay, watch over the backs of the investigators, making sure that they're meeting all their terms and conditions. So I got a good feel for how people do research. That was uh, very engaging and informative. But I do have to say, um, I, I did some writing. I was in charge of a lot of writing projects, but writing wasn't the central thrust. The writing piece, uh, if I were to recall way back, a kind of a harbinger of how this all thing started is I began my first job as on the editorial desk of a business magazine. I was in charge of a, re a region, the Benelux, Belgium, Netherlands, and Luxembourg. And I had to edit the stories coming out of there, cover it, and occasionally write my own. So mm -hmm. kind of full circle writing, starting in the writing and then ending. I mean, I'm not ending, but... <laughs> Not at all, not at all. Uh, speaking about your latest writing achievement, why and how did the book come about? What was your motivation, inspiration? Um, this is a very good question. And um, I think you're probably alluding in addition to the title because the title is kind of the, uh, the driving force. Um, I get a lot of com uh, questions about the title. So let me just start by explaining the title. Uh, Alzheimer's fantasy in the key of G. What's the key of G you might ask? Is it music theory? No, no, it is a, it's a literary device. I was trying to find a way to unify uh, several family themes going on. First, my, my mother's family name, Griffin and Griffey, those two appear in the book. That's her, that was her maiden name. Um, Galaxy, Gravity, and G Clef. Those other, those three also figure in certain ways. My father had his, and my grandmother had his head in the stars. He, uh, he left pediatrics when he was a young man and he went to work for uh, NASA, 
Um, who knew? Why would one do this? Um, my, my, um, and let's say gravity, on the other hand, my, my mother's and our feet were solidly placed on the ground. We didn't want any part of this space-related endeavor, although we were proud. Um, so gravity and the G clef. There's a little bit of a G. Here's my book. Mm -hmm. Is that G clef? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's to kind of um, do the unifying, but also my my uh, there was music in the house. We all had music lessons. People, um, brother and my father sang in chorales, so there was some music. So all that I I it came upon me, and I just put it in. Now, set, and the next point I want to make is the fantasy part. Why a fantasy? And that kind of um, get a lot of questions on that. I was really kind of at a loss as I was visiting my mother late in her dementia in her hospital room. And I didn't know how I might reach, how I might connect with her, but I kind of thought, well, here we are, we're the two of us, I'm on my track, she's on her track. What if, um, what if I use her dementia to kind of make an exploration into her brain? I mean, not her real brain, but an imaginative narrative space where I might reach her and where I might speak for her and where she might let me speak for her. So that's all the fantasy. It's kind of being in the, um, I, we start out, the book starts out in, in her hospital room and I'm, um, I'm ha we're having this back and forth. I'm connected to her at some points, not a lot, because she's drifted away, and I'm imagining her trying to connect to me. This back and forth in the ho hospital room at that time, on that particular day, trying to connect. So that's what the fantasy was. Fantasy kind of was the way to use the connect to get the connection. And why this approach rather than maybe a more traditional writing of a memoir? Well, um, I, again, in that hospital room, I, I felt, I felt like I was witnessing something very, you know, dreadful. I was witnessing my mother's decline and um, I felt compelled to take notes and write about it. And I, I would come home from those, um, um, those those visits, not write about it in a um, in a literary way. Like I I hadn't yet devised the I had got re realized that I had the idea to write a memoir. I was just kind of taking fast and furious copious notes to get it all down. You know the medical jargon, the setting, the her condition. It was all this medicalized and. I, I sat down and I bumped out 40, 50, 60 pages in no time at all. But when they, I, when I read it, it, re it really didn't sound, it wasn't the story. It really was, it was too medicalized. She wasn't any, I was writing about her care, but she wasn't anywhere in there. So I'm saying to myself, do I put, different points of view in. I mean, I've got my point of view, she must have hers. So I did, I started putting other points of view in there. And I even put the third person point of view of a reader addressing of a right of a, a narrator addressing the readers of the book. So we've got a lot of things going on. <laughs> I thought it would make, I thought it would make for, uh, make more relatable and appealing reading. Oh, very much so. What was it like as far as writing those juggling accounts? How did you go about either conceptualizing, planning, uh, shifting from one viewpoint to the next? I did have to shift and I did have to mind my P's and Q's be, and, and be, self, be a self-editor to the max because the threads could get confused a lot. Um, but I, I kind of, I put those, um, I put that final piece, the narrator addressing the reader, I put that piece in 
uh, the final, um, maybe the final minus third or final minus one version. When I put that in, um, that was a way to help me understand who was who and who was talking and who was thinking. So in a kind of a con converse fashion, the points of points of view were confusing, but they were also um, the way I sorted through it. It's kind of, I don't, not really getting, making that point clear, but it fell on the page in, uh, in a way that made sense to me. So I, I, th I thought I'd keep going with it. No, it works extremely well. For those who haven't read the book yet, would you just share a little bit about your mother, about Fran, and then we'll continue talking about the book in more detail itself. My mother, this is how I remember her. You see that cigarette, uh, light, um, cigarette holder? She was the only person I ever knew apart from you know, holiday, a Hollywood movie with Clark Gable or somebody and the, the ladies that were all very elegantly appointed in their Chanel suits, like this, this bright yellow one with that scarf, that crazy scarf. She waved that cigarette lighter everywhere. She was, she was witty, she was uh, flashy, she was um, very um, good with words. She also, but on the other hand, she considered herself like the the ugly duckling. She didn't uh, didn't think of herself as being a pretty person or good looking, but it it as she I think uh, and and she I think was abashed by that in her early years, but I think she outgrew it, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure to this day whether um, she's really. Um, she really did think she was the uh, uh, ugly duckling. I think she probably thought it in the beginning, but didn't think it at the end. And we even would have these conversations. Generally, she's the one who brought it up. Are you a slob or are you a snob? <laughs> <laughs> and yes and no, she was, she called, she called herself the slob, but that way of dressing is not slobby. And the, she liked the finer things in life. So um, I think she was a, a rebel without a cause, always looking to make a nice, make a joke. Uh, I mean, not, not, no, not, she wasn't a comic. She was trying to make a witty mm -hmm. repartee at all times. Oh. I, I yeah. admired that. Most definitely, most definitely. You know, another fascinating layer to the book is the way you've incorporated your family's history uh, throughout. Um, would you share just first a little bit about how did you go about researching your family's history? And then tell us a little bit about the role it plays throughout the book. I give the credit entirely to my cousin, and this was serendipity to the max, really. Around the time that I was you know, visiting my mother and I was writing down these notes and um, she, had, she was doing her own geneal genealogical research about the family. Her mother and, uh, and her father was my mother's brother. And she uh, um, did, she put pages and pages of spreadsheets and death and marriage certificates. She went all the way back to the 1700s. I didn't know this. One day, out of the blue, an email from her comes with three zip files chock full of, of information. I, I opened it up and I saw the spreadsheet, the thing, and I, I zeroed in on Thomas Griffin from Limerick. And I said, geez, this could be the guy I'm looking for. <laughs> so that spurred me to spend hours and hours online in the Massachusetts archives of ship manifests. And that's how I uh, found the Daniel Webster. 
you can you can put in a name you can type in a name and you can they'll it'll it'll bring back a, a search results of names of ships and dates and who came with the person um so i found these two brothers michael and thomas it was 1853 they left liverpool in september and they arrived in the port of boston november 26 something like that something like an eight week voyage. And that was exactly, that corresponded uh, very, very closely to the dates that she had in her, she didn't have any names of ships or anything. And she mm -hmm. had, you know, bare facts like immigrated to Boston in 1853. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, how many Thomas Griffins are there coming to Boston in 1853? Good, might, I might not have the right guy, but the family story is, this is totally plausible. And so I built it up from that. Right, and it and just- I also knew that um, my, uh, grand, my great grandfather, the man you see in the picture who set, uh, set up the Freightainer com company, that was a hauler. He was a trucker. How did he get hauling and trucking sk skills? So I imagined that he served in the railroad. <laughs> <laughs> no, it works so well. And again, just speaks to the unique approach you took to uh, telling Fran's story. Um, Thank you very much. I'm having my own fantasy going on myself, but it's not all made up. It's made up some and based in fact. What were maybe some of the challenges writing this type of book? Well, I, as I alluded to before, I needed to keep my um, myself straight on who was who. Um, I had, um, uh, before I, remember I, I mentioned that I put in uh, the reader, uh, the, um, the narrator who addressed the reader. I did that after I got some feedback, some friends who, who had re read some prior drafts found that the story was really two stories, the story of my mother in the present day with Alzheimer's and another family story. And they, mm -hmm. they, they did not mesh at all. And that was, I was a bit dismayed to hear, but I could see where that criticism came from. So I, I even, I doubled up my efforts to make the points of view clearer and situate people better and and that helped in um, embedding the uh, present story into the past and the past story into the present, so that they so that one didn't stay only in the past and one didn't stay only in the present. Mm -hmm. You know, looking back, what are some of the things you learned about yourself, your mother, and the relationship between the two of you from writing the book? Well, one of my motivations was we had a, fra uh, a fractious relationship, she and me. Um, I admired her, um, but uh, the caregiving part and our own family mismanagement, and you know, when when the elderly people grow more frail, more elderly, and in they're not really capable they get curmudgeonly and that's uh, that was a detriment to her, her character she wasn't a curmudgeon but she became one I felt terrible about that I felt terrible about terrible about Alzheimer's which was robbing her taking her away so I was motivated to rectify that image and to go back to the person whom I knew mm -hmm. um, so that 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 was a piece that I I, 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 I was dealing in, in her honor. I wanted to make sure that we could capture the, the, my, my mother as I remembered her. Mm -hmm. um, some Wonderful. of the things that I learned, I mean, I, I thought I was telling her, her story. I thought, you know, I'm, I'm doing this for you, mom. But really I was telling my own in a certain sense, obviously she's my mother. So her story is mine. But, sure. And I didn't, know, of course, I knew that at some level, but 
it took writing the book for me to internalize it in a way that now I know I wrote this for her, but I also wrote it because it mattered to me. Mm -hmm. No, it's a wonderful tribute. What's some of the reaction and feedback you've gotten about the book from both family members and others? Um, I've, I've had some great support from friends and uh, namely some of the people who weighed in early on and I'm grateful for that feedback because it, it really helps me reorient my thinking. Um, people have been, friends have been su supremely uh, encouraging and they, they almost, it's not that they can't believe it, but they're like, go you or sharing in, sharing in, in, in the, um, in the achievement and mm -hmm. recognizing it at all the stages, my daughters, my husband, likewise, it's, it's been very gratifying to see that as for my, the family that I grew up in, my parents are deceased. I have two brothers and a sister and, um, they are not interested. They mm -hmm. are uh, curiously uninvolved, um, my, I had written an academic piece uh, entitled My Mother the Smoker many, many years ago. It, this was um, when I realized that she was a pack a day smoker for 63 years, but she did not die of lung cancer. I thought that that was remarkable. So mm -hmm. I, I went into a, a long uh, piece about her. Um, uh, her smoking and, and what smoking means and all that. Um, they wouldn't read that one either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was a kind of a clue when I, uh, you know, began mentioning this or that, that I wasn't going to get much of a reaction and I didn't. And I, well, don't think I'll have the answer for it. You know, in addition to uh, family and friends, You've also received some recognition in the publishing world. Would yes, you share a little bit about that, please? Um, well, I, you know, I don't, I didn't really know about all this, these competitions. I, I, a fellow writer, I kind of copied some of the ones that she competed in herself. I got the names from there. And so I said, well, I mean, what, what do I have to lose? I might, might just send them the book and maybe we'll see what happens. So I, I entered four competitions and I came out a winner in two and I'm still waiting for two more. This is one of them in the Independent Press Award, a distinguished favorite uh, in that category called new nonfiction. And they, you know, it, it, you have to pay to enter these. So this is, I, I like most things you have to pay to enter. It, uh, it is, it does mean something. Most um, definitely. But it, it also, you know, let me just be clear that um, I wasn't selected out of the universe of people sight unseen. I presented them my book and I paid an entrance fee. But but so do 60,000 uh, people or what, what did the guy, the guy that they told me, Entr en entries from 60 countries, in not only the US and, and 135 different categories and thousands and thousands of, of entrants. So wow. it's an incredible accomplishment. There's another one, I, I uh, The Shelf Unbound, which is a literary magazine. I, they, they, um, they gave me a, a, a a top top notable distinction also. You know, having been through the process of uh, caregiving for your mother for many years, what's some advice you might give others in similar roles when dealing with um, relatives, friends with Alzheimer's and dementia? Well, um, I would say don't get over involved in the medical part. Let the doctors and the nurses uh, talk to you about the medical part, explain 
what it all means, but don't don't pretend you're a doctor and go try to research it and understand it better than they do. They, they, you're not in competition with them. That's their field. And I, I was happy to let, to be directed by the medical caregivers. Mm -hmm. I, um, I also wanted, to, I also learned that um, validating the story is a, is a, is a giant plus and nobody can do that but you. You can tell the story Others can tell theirs and, you know, let everyone tell their story. Let's and mm -hmm. let, let it all just be out there. Well, you did. I all, and and in from a kind of a, dare I say, selfish point of view, I, I, I learned or some of the advice I give for myself in, in, regarding Alzheimer's caregiving, I want to stay as far away from Alzheimer's as I possibly can. And so I do crazy things like left-handed, I do crossword puzzles left-handed. I do Sudoku in color, the expert level, and the ones that take an hour and a half to do one single puzzle. I, I'm, I'm, um, I exercise like a fiend. I, I dance. I use dance for posture, memory, balance, and neurons, and it's great. <laughs> now, the, it's very good habits uh, and approaches uh, for all of us to consider. And just the research um, by different medical companies and academics, it sounds more and more promising. A lot of people, uh, paying attention, giving yeah. their life's right. work to uh, better coping with this disease for sure. So definitely something in the news almost daily. Yeah. Um, I, I became a member of, um, I mean, I went to the discussion groups of the Alzheimer's um, organization that's the big they're mostly research oriented i've heard a few i've read a few of their um announcements about some of the drugs i don't think they've got a miracle drug yet but not there yet might be something. not yet but i know just the other day and we'll just end it with here some very promising research about mutations and how that can be used to uh, slow down early onset. Alzheimer's was fascinating to read. Mm, just this wonderful. Past week. There, well, there you have it. I am glad that we got the physician scientists out there doing that because I rely upon them. Well, we're glad that you took the time to write this account of okay. Frank and your mother and definitely encourage viewers and others to go pick up a copy of Alzheimer's Fantasy in the Key of G. Thanks so much, Kirsten, for being here and best of luck with all future projects. You are most welcome and thank you for having me. Also want to thank those of you watching for joining us and hope you'll be able to tune in next time.